welcome to 2024. We are glad you have chosen to be with us today. And uh, we also hope that you'll look over the bulletin. You'll find some information there that will be helpful, especially for some things that are going on this week. And then one other thing, we are updating the church directory. And if you would like to be a part of that, uh, there are some forms back there on the table straight through the center doors where you can give us any changes or any additions. If you're new to the congregation, if you have any questions, see Karen. That's her, her project, and she will be glad to help you. Did you look outside late Friday night or early Saturday morning? It was beautiful. Uh, everything covered in white. Uh, I noticed uh, in the evening before I went to bed and the different lights that are on around our property, specifically over there at the Parsonage, it was just such a beautiful, pure white scene, which I thought is appropriate for our call to worship that we have today. And that beautiful scene reminds us when it says, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, and the new is here. Amen. The purity and the beauty of when Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit, is at the center of our lives. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the new year, and we thank you for the new opportunities that are come our way for this new year. And we pray that as we gather here today, as we sing together, pray together, and look at the Word together, may we truly experience not only being together with one another, but being together, walking in unity with Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm glad to see everybody here this morning. And I hope you're ready to sing and worship the Lord together. Let's sing one that we haven't sang in I don't know how long. Um, Surely goodness and mercy. Psalm 23. i 
turn to Psalm 23. And for our scripture reading today, I'd like for us to read responsibly this tremendous Psalm of David. In the hymnal, it's page 106. If you would just like to follow the reading on the screen, uh, the words will be available there. I will lead us by leading the, reading the dark point, dark print, and you are asked to respond in unison. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. May God add his richest blessings upon the reading of the word. And these uh, words of the psalmist are going to permeate our entire time together today. Let's continue to sing. Surely goodness, 
as I think about this song, Gentle Shepherd. You know, animals trust someone who is gentle with them. They feel that they can trust them, right? But don't you know that David also, as it says in scriptures, he had to protect, right? He had to protect those sheep. And he had to sometimes be the mighty protector. Isn't that the way he is for us? Sometimes he's so gentle. When we come to him and we are hurting and we don't know which way to turn, and he gently guides us along. And then sometimes he is our mighty protector. When we are walking through those storms and the enemy is, is meeting us on every side, and is trying his best to defeat us. And yet our gentle shepherd rises up and he is the mighty king and he is the protector. And we have so much to be thankful for this morning and so much to praise his name for. I praise his name this morning for he is so good to me. Let's sing gentle shepherd. Sing it to the Lord this morning.
still in the Psalms, Psalms 42, talking about the deer panting for water and how David wrote that his soul was panting for the Lord, just for a touch from him. This morning, I just feel like I should say these altars are open. this morning there have been a lot of things happen this week I had a good report from the doctor and I praise his name for that yes. Yes. and that he is always with us even through those times of uncertainty so I feel like when we're singing any time through the song if you want to come and you want to pray please do you won't be interrupting anything, I promise you. That's why we're here. Yes, ma'am. We have a special request sure. for uh, Scott Dolash. He's in the hospital. He was here just not too long ago, and he used to attend here okay, when yeah. he went to SIUE. Right. And he is in desperate need for, for help. He was in the hospital for pneumonia, but he has had many complications from a lifetime of diabetes. Okay. And so his... Um, his heart was having uh, some issues, um, and then it got a little better. And uh, but his kidneys were also in danger. Okay. And now his heart has—they've discovered his heart has been damaged also. Okay. So he's in desperate need of our sure. prayers.
As we come to prayer tonight, one of the things that I've heard since I've been in town, when asked, how was your holiday? I hear words like, it was nice, but so busy. It seems appropriate that we should begin the first Sunday of the new year with a quiet, somber, reflective attitude. I don't believe in the teachings of all peoples, but uh, the Native Americans of our world taught that every once in a while they had to sit down and let their soul catch up with their body. Perhaps that's where we are today. So we, not in a bombastic, loud voice, but in a quiet, humble spirit, seek the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. Yes, thank you. May he alone be our heart's desire. And we do pray for the physical needs that are represented. We, we pray for Scott. We pray that you would be very real to him right now. Yes. He, has a, he is a part of our family. We just ask that uh, your Holy Spirit would be very near to him. We pray that the healing touch of Jesus might be placed upon him. Yes. And Lord, we just realize that uh, for all of us, when you alone are our heart's desire, when we truly worship you, then we can testify like the Apostle Paul that all things do work together for the good and that we do become more like our brother, Jesus Christ. Again, Lord, we pray for the requests that are listed on the back side of our worship folders. Our prayer is that uh, though we know names and we know some faces, you know every situation. And what's right. even more Hum is that you know the condition of every heart. And so we pray that not only would you meet the outward, external, circumstantial needs of the people who are on the list there, but our prayer is that this time when they have requested prayer would be a time when the circumstances of life cause them to remember Jesus Christ. And our prayer is that as they seek you for the situations that are temporal in nature, you know, that you would use as a time for your Holy Spirit to do his work. Uh, you say that when, Jesus, you say that when you're lifted up, all people will be guided and led to you. So we lift up Jesus Christ for each situation that's listed on our bulletins today yeah. and ask that uh, they would be drawn not only to the power of your grace to calm waters, but may we experience the power of your grace to calm inward conflicts, to calm a lack of peace deep within. We do thank you for the new year. We thank you for the opportunities that are ahead of us. And our prayer today is that as we return to Psalm 23, as we look closely at this testimony of the King David, that it would become our testimony also. And Lord, we realize that what he sings, or what he says, he actually probably didn't sing this song. And what he sang was, you alone are my strength, you alone are my shield. And he commits himself to only yield to you. And so we pray those words with him, you alone are my strength. settles down upon us and all the people of God said Amen, Amen.
Amen. If you would take your Bibles and turn with me to Psalm 23 again. We are going to pick up uh, with verses 2 and 3. There is an end of this series. Uh, I just don't know how soon it will be. But I hope that you are experiencing the fact that uh, there is such a depth in this psalm that it drips, every word drips with significant insight into what it is to be a follower of the shepherd. Yes. I know I really believe that God has graciously given us 66 books of the Bible, 39 in the Old Testament and 27 in the New Testament. But I believe that there are certain passages of Scripture that are so rich that if that's the only passage of Scripture that we ever had, we could develop a relationship with Jesus Christ through that passage. I'm reminded of a a young lady who was being held uh, during the Nazi regime there in Germany, and uh, somehow she got a hold of one page, the first chapter of the Gospel of Mark. And when they found her and she was released from the bondage of being under the Nazi control there, she had taken that paper that contained the first chapter of Mark, and she had read it so many times, running her finger across each line, that the words were almost gone. And she maintained a walk of faith, experienced Jesus Christ with the first chapter of the Gospel of Mark. And we shouldn't be surprised of that fact because Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 tells us, and I quote, the word of God is living and active, able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. It is alive, it's active, and it helps us to understand the way we think and the intentions of our hearts. And one of the proofs of that fact that the scriptures are living and active is how consistent they are. Have you noticed we can read one passage for the first time and we get some encouraging words and then we read it a second time and we read it a third time and we still see something that we never noticed in a prior study. Psalm 23 has been noted as the most well-known of all the Psalms and is revered by Christians and Jews alike. The 23rd Psalm, the Shepherd's Psalm, became especially popular after it was included in the Anglican Book of Common Prayer. The 23rd Psalm is so popular that uh, it's used in funerals. Uh, In fact, if you watch TV, You watch shows that may have someone who has passed away and they give a brief look at the person's memorial service. Oftentimes, they will include in the script a quote from Psalm 23. Psalm 23, we've read it. We've quoted it. We've heard it dozens, maybe hundreds of times, but something new jumps off the page every time we read it, including this week. We ended prior to the Advent season, verse 23, or chapter 23, verse 3, when it says, He restores my soul. And it goes on in that verse to say, He guides me. Now notice, not in the path that is right, but it's plural. He guides me in the paths that are right. In other words, if we take the totality of Scripture, we would discover discover that from Genesis all the way through the book of Revelation, the life of faith is a journey. We are travelers. And as travelers in life, we understand that life is filled with many different paths. Typically, we choose a path that appears to be the most attractive. However, if you've lived long enough, you'll discover at the end of the path that appeared easiest, we discover that it was filled with rocks, thickets, 
and unpleasant experiences. So you know what we do? Well, we'll try another path and then another and then another. And for many of us, life becomes a sorrowful lament with the words, if I only knew what to do. In verse 3, David reminds us that we are sheep and that sheep are prone to wander. That sheep often go astray. And the truth is we are like sheep. It is easy to go through life with no direction. We wander our our unguided way from place to place and path to path. But my friends, I would like to take what David says in chapter 23, the Lord's shepherd psalm, the Lord's my shepherd, Psalm 23. And I want us to understand one basic fact, that God's desire is that his sheep, his followers, don't have lives filled with uncertainty. In fact, he begins verse 1 by saying, the Lord is my shepherd. We're going to go back and look at verse 1 again, but it's the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, all letters capitalized, and he is not a shepherd. He's not just the shepherd. He's my shepherd. And he keeps building on that fact. And when you get down to verse 3, he says, the shepherd guides me. The shepherd guides me in the paths of righteousness. And as I noted earlier, literally that reads, the shepherd leads me in the right paths. The correct paths. We don't have to have an uncertainty that our life is headed in the direction fulfills God's purpose for our lives. And as we review David's life, we understand that he realized that and he experienced it in the early years of his life. You know what the path was? He was a farmhand on dad's farm. Then he served as a soldier, a good soldier, a great soldier. And in his final years, David was a politician. He was a king of the nation of Israel. And so when he says, the shepherd leads me in the right paths, he understands that life is a journey. And the truth is, just like David, our lives contain complexities and bewilderment. But he says, even though life contains complexities and bewilderments, he declares, because the Lord is my shepherd, I never lack guidance. Now, to fully understand what he's saying, to reach the depth of the truth that's found in Psalm 23, we have to take to remind ourselves of the type of land, the terrain of the land where David lived. The land was filled with numerous paths. In fact, when you think of, or when I think, when I read this, you may join with me in thinking this, talk about a multitude of paths. I'm re- I'm, I went to the New Testament where Jesus talks about, you know, the seeds, some fall along this path and some fall along that path, and there are just a variety of paths. And there are numerous paths throughout the land where David lived. And not only were there a great number of paths, there was also a wide variety of paths. The feet of hundreds of travelers wore a different paths onto the landscape of the world where David lived. Blowing winds created paths across the land. Some paths were carved out by robbers. Robbers who wanted to lead unsuspecting travelers astray. Sounds like the work of the enemy even today, doesn't it? The enemy to our walk of faith. The robber's real evil intent was to steal the traveler's goods. And if they could lead the shepherd and the flock astray, they could then ambush the shepherd 
and even take off with some of the sheep. The terrain of the land where David lived, paths everywhere, different kinds different kinds of complexities, different kinds of interruptions to life. So let's take it a step further and look at the truth of David's life when he says, he leads me in the right paths. Here is the deep truth of Psalm 23. You ready? It's profound. It's countercultural. It goes way beyond the way we typically think and pray. When the Good Shepherd guides us, He not only takes us to the right places, but He takes us and makes us the right kind of people. See, our tendency, well, Lord, should I take this job or should I take that job over there? Um, we really feel it's time to move. Should the next years of our lives be in this location or in that location? Let's get real culture. Where should I attend church? what we like over there. And what happens in our lives? Find and ask God to give us the right place to land. And the thing that desire that God desires, the thing that we see in Psalm 23 is God's greatest concern isn't the place that we're located or where our vocation is. His most important desire is what kind of God's leading is not primarily vocation or location. God always wants to lead us to a right life. A life that reflects mature, godly character. Wow. That's Psalm 23. When you tear it apart, when you let each phrase drip the truth, when you unpack the different words, when we really take time to not only look at the words and say a little prayer after we read it, but when we allow the Spirit of Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God the Father, the Holy Spirit himself, to take the truths, we understand that life has a variety of paths, and we will have different paths throughout our lives. And what's really important is not finding the right location, not finding the right vocation, it's becoming the right person. It's found throughout the scriptures. It's the truth of scripture. The Bible will never, in my opinion, contain a passage to tell me where to go to college. I really don't believe that the Bible will give a scripture that indicates if we should accept the new position. I really believe that nowhere in Scripture do we find an answer to this. Should we get married? Charles Shedd said it so well. Whenever I marry a couple, we go counseling, and I use Charles Shedd's quote, which is this The key to a successful marriage is not finding the right kind of person or the right person, excuse me, the right kind of person, it's you becoming the right person. What does the Bible tell us? If I can't find in Scripture, if I should take a new location or accept a new job responsibility or get married, what does the Bible tell us? I'm glad we asked that question because in 1 Thessalonians, the Apostle Paul, 1 Thessalonians, Thessalonians, <laughs> chapter 1, verse 
chapter 4 and 5, the Apostle Paul tells us in plain, well, he wrote in Koine Greek, and because of Bible translators, we can read it in plain old English. And if you have a new international version, some contemporary type of English, if you have the message, it has a paraphrase in 21st century English. It's very interesting how the Apostle Paul tells us and explains to us what is God's will. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 4, words. it is God's will. Well, there's that 12-letter word that gets thrown around throughout the Church of the Nazarene, and there's much debate among different movements of faith of what exactly is sanctification. Well, what is it? Paul helps us by going on down through verse 7 and telling us what it means to be sanctified. Verse 3, we avoid sexual immorality. Verse 4, we learn to control our own bodies. Verse 5, we live in a manner that is holy and honorable. Verse 5, we're not in a passionate lust. Verse 5, we're not like people who do not know God. Verse 6, we never take advantage of anyone else. Verse 7, you know what the bottom line is? To be sanctified is we live a holy life. That's the bottom line. And it doesn't matter where I am attending college. It doesn't matter if I'm married or not. It doesn't matter if I'm a good paying job or a minimal wage job. The truth is God's desire is that we live a holy life right where we are. Amen. If that weren't enough, he goes on in chapter 5. Verse 16, 17, and 18, and he gives us further information on how we can live according to God's will. Verse number 16 says, Rejoice when things are going well. I wish it said that. <laughs> Rejoice always. Well, how can I do that? Verse 17, pray continually. You mean I got to be, when even on my job, kind of in this? No. If you're like this, you're going to not get your job done. And if you try to do this while you're walking across the street, you're going to get run over by a car. See, we have made prayer this particular stance and, you know, a particular place. No, we can pray continually because we have a relationship with the Holy Spirit and because he's with us and we are nurturing that relationship. Where we are, what we're facing, we're, we're praying, we're talking. He's conversing with us. Rejoice always, pray continually. And verse 18, give thanks, notice, not for all circumstances. Oh, thank you, Lord, that that guy cut me off. <laughs> thank you, Lord, that somebody hacked into my account and stole what, left, what was left in my account. No, it doesn't say that. Don't thank God. We don't thank God for all circumstances, but we thank him and praise him in what? All circumstances. Again, it does, it's not a matter of location. It's not a matter of vocation. It's a matter of what kind of people are we becoming. And then verse 18, there it is again. This is God's will. See, God's guidance has to do with what we are, not where we are. And if we are what God wants us to be, God has no trouble placing us where God wants us to be. Notice we flipped it. Well, Lord, if I just get over there, 
If you just get me out of this office with all the bickering and all, you know, it's just a terrible place to work. It could be. So we thank God, not for the circumstances, but in all circumstances. And Lord, I want you to make me what you want me to be. And when the time comes for me to move on, you'll open the doors. I don't have to. I'm amazed. I had a DS tell, say this somebody, to a friend of mine. We were young in our ministry, and we were talking about, you know, getting a different church and moving on, moving up. And uh, it wasn't a district. I um, checked in my. It was a general superintendent who looked my friend square in the eye and says, "Well, my friend, God gets credit or blame for some things, many things that He had no part of." <laughs> He's referring to <laughs> using a crowbar to open up some doors. You know what God, number one purpose is? Verse three, restore my soul. And we talked about when we looked at that verse, it means close to his heart. And when we are close to God's heart, we can count on it. That the shepherd is going to lead us to the right places. So let's pull this all together. Let's talk about the depth of the way of faith. This is so countercultural. Please understand that we have moved so far from the teaching of Scripture. We have so watered down the truth that we have come up with a 21st century American concept of what it is to be a person of faith. And believe me, it's watered down. In fact, sometimes... We wonder if there's any really seed of truth still in there. It says there, back to Psalm 23, let me turn to it here. You guys have it memorized. You probably don't need to return to it, but I still have to look at it. Psalm 23, verse 2. He leads me, verse 3, he guides me. God's direction is not a contemporary GPS system. God's direction grows out of a personal relationship with him, the shepherd. God does not give us a road map and tell us, follow each step carefully. God's way is, I'll go ahead of you, I'll go ahead, and you follow me. Yeah. Well, can you give me biblical truth of that? I'm glad you asked. Father Abraham, Genesis chapter 12. Oh, we like to talk about, you know, his call in the first four verses. God spoke to him and said, go to the place that I will show you. Notice how broad. I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to bless those who bless you. And I'm going to bless all the nations of the world through you. Well, where am I going? To the place that I will show you. Can you imagine when we went home to Sarah? Pack up the stuff. We're headed home. We're headed. We're headed out. Where are we headed? The place that God will show us. And that is so formative and so basic to the depth of the way of faith that when you get to Hebrews chapter eleven verse eight, as the Hebrew writer takes another look back at the life of Abraham and talks about the fact that he is an example of the way of faith. It says, verse 8, Hebrews 11, by faith, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, he obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. Wow. 
whoa. Let's get the truth even from the picture that David gets us. Ruth talked about how we're aware that, you know, uh, the, the uh, shepherd uh, carries a rod and a staff. And the picture that we have, and Ruth talked about, oftentimes when the sheep begins to wander, you know what the shepherd, he takes the staff and, you know, hooks the animal and gently pulls them back to safety. I found out in research that the staff was also used in another way. What they would do is if uh, they would come upon a fruit tree, the shepherd would take the staff, reach up, and pull down a limb that contained fresh fruit. And would pull a piece or two of the fruit from the tree, and then he would reach out and offer it to the sheep. As they walked along, as that piece of succulent fruit was offered to the animals, they would nibble and get a taste of that sweet fruit. And they would crowd around and get as close as they could to keep eating. Isn't that beautiful? Here's the depth. You ready? Here's the depth of Psalm 23 and the depth of the way of faith. The shepherd leads as he feeds. The shepherd leads us as he feeds us. We come now to the core value of my ministry Since 1979, the basic core value of my call as a servant of Jesus Christ is the fact that the shepherd leads as he feeds, then we must value God's word. It's not something we can ah, take or leave. The option of, well, you know, up to get discipled, if I show up to hear a sermon, it's not that big a deal. Yes, it is. It's central. It's a core value. Why am I yelling? (laughs) Because I feel very strongly. Reading, studying, reflecting, meditating on God's Word, please understand That's when the Holy Spirit opens truths and shows God's people how to move. Not location or vocation, but how are we maturing in our walk of faith? And it says, notice, he leads us for his name's sake. Whoa! You mean the purpose of life is me to get everything I want and ask God to bless it? Yeah, that's right. There is a greater purpose to our lives, and we will never experience the full satisfaction of life until we understand that when we are walking according to his purposes and when he is working daily in our lives and we are experiencing a relationship with him, that's when life reaches its fullest satisfaction. He leads For his name's sake. See, the shepherd values his reputation. To lead a flock into the wilderness and to lose that flock in the era of David was a disgrace. And David boldly proclaims, I want you to know something, that God can be trusted and he will never lead you astray. The Lord God is jealous for his name, so all sheep who follow him will be guided safely home. In his book, Everyday Conflict, Ken Sandy tells about observing a visually impaired woman 
who resisted the repeated warnings of her loyal and protective guide dog. He writes, One day during my morning run, I noticed a blind woman walking on the other side of the street with her seeing eye dog, a beautiful golden retriever. As I was about to pass them, I noticed a car blocking the driveway a few paces ahead of them. At that moment, the dog paused and gently pressed his shoulder against the woman's leg, signaling her to turn aside so that they could get around the car. Now, I'm sure that she normally followed the lead, but that day she didn't seem to trust her guide dog. The fact is, he said, I assumed that she had probably walked this route many times before and knew this was not the normal place to make a turn. Whatever the cost, she wouldn't move to the side and instead gave him a signal to move ahead. The animal again pressed his shoulder against her leg, trying to guide her on the safe path. She angrily ordered the dog to go forward. When he again declined, she got mad. Her temper flared. As I was about to speak up, when the dog once more put his shoulder gently against her leg, sure enough, she kicked him, and then she impulsively stepped forward and bumped square into a car, reaching out to feel the shape in front of her, she immediately realized what happened. Dropping to her knees, she threw her arms around the dog and spoke sobbing words into his ears. You know, we're, we're entering the halfway point of Psalm 23. This is the first Sunday of 2024. I am humbled how God takes the word and makes it applicable for where we are. We're talking about the value of God's word. We're talking about the value of relationships, not only relationships with God, but relationships with one another. And there's one announcement in the bulletin that I didn't highlight. It's the second light week it's been in there. Lord willing, we will seek to offer three more opportunities where we can show our valuing of the Word of God, which goes way beyond showing up and listening to a sermon, but includes being a part of a group where we can be accountable and grow truth is, for some of us, we've kicked the dog many times, got angry when the pressure was applied. You know, for some of us, you know what we need to do is, as we enter 2024? Hit our knees and wrap our arms around Jesus Christ and ask him to forgive us for treating him, his agenda, his purpose, and his way of faith so flippantly. One thing I learned a long time ago in a psychology class, first year of college, they tell us that it takes three weeks to establish a habit. Ever since then, I've been tracing people's commitment to church attendance and small groups and the disciplines of the faith. It's amazing how in my early years of ministry, people would get to two weeks and then miss. Now it's maybe even one week, and then you don't see them for a long time. It's the depth of the way of faith. 
And what we need to understand is that the depth of the way of faith in our lives impacts the depth and the effectiveness of this local church. We don't have the resources to put on a great big program. But I really believe that it's not a matter of location. It's not a matter of vocation. It's not a matter of numbers. In fact, the greatest churches may not have have a big crowd, but they have a huge heart. A heart for people and a heart for God. John Wesley most scholars, lot many scholars feel that the, way, the reason the Western revival spread across England and impacted America is not only holiness preaching, but if you were going to be a part of the gang, if you were part of the team, you were a part of a discipleship group that met regularly. And they even had a list of questions that were asked. And you know what the last question was? At any point as we asked these questions, did you lie to us? See, we're in a flippant way of faith. May God give us the grace to quit kicking the guide dog. He's not a dog at all. He's the person of the Holy Spirit. And may we be willing to bow before him, embrace him, confess that we're prone to wander and ask him to enable us to do what needs to be done to cease wandering, to follow the right paths. Father, after four and a half decades of preaching the scriptures and teaching the scriptures, I continue to be humbled and amazed of how true Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 is. And what our prayer is that we here at Glenview would not fall into the trap of many ways of contemporary teachings concerning faith. May we not keep the Bible sacred, but keep it dusty. May we cease having dozen Bibles around the house, but never really taking time to read them on our own, or not even being a part of ministry where the teachings are taught and where we are made accountable in the fellowship of the community. Forgive us for being so so flippant. And Lord, our prayer is that this year we would go deeper than we've ever gone. That we would get beyond the right vocation, the right location, the right church. May we become the right people. The song we've sung throughout this series, and we sang it earlier in this service, and Chuck's playing again. There's no other we can turn to who can help us find the right path, become the right person. Come and lead us, and we realize that you're going to lead us through your feeding us. So, on this very first Sunday of 2024, may we be willing, as the bulletin reads, to consider the opportunities of discipleship that are going to be made available. Let's sing it together just one time. Let's sing through General Shepherd one more time.
Lead us and feed us. face today. We're bombarded with anti-Christ ways of thinking. We need to know the Christ way of thinking. spirit of submission and may that openness to the leading of the good shepherd our shepherd the lord jesus christ be a living reality through the coming week and all the people of god said amen god bless you as you go